Good evening, and welcome to OptiView's fourth webinar in the series, How to Master OCT and OCTA. Tonight, we are pleased to introduce Dr. Michael Simbor of Nittany Eye Associates, who will discuss how to utilize OCT and OCTA in detection and management of glaucoma. In this session, Dr. Simbor will explain how to interpret OCT scans, how to assess change over time, and how to evaluate vascular changes with OCT angiography. Please use the Q&A box located on your screen to submit questions throughout the presentation, and Dr. Simber will answer as many as he can at the end. This webinar will also be available to watch on demand on optometricmanagement.com. Dr. Simber, please take it away. Thank you very much, Angela. Again, my name is Mike Simber, and for 21 years, uh, I've been practicing optometry, but of 18 uh, of those years, I have been on the front lines of glaucoma care, like many of you. Um, and as, as we know, each glaucoma patient that we see, they're, they're kind of ours for life. So I've accumulated a large number of glaucoma patients in our practice. But about three years ago, uh, we brought in a fellowship-trained uh, glaucoma subspecialist, uh, an ophthalmologist. And, and he and I uh, have been working together for the last three years in a glaucoma referral center. So part of my week is, is, um, uh, is, is kind of set up where I'm seeing a lot of glaucoma referral patients. So that is kind of my background, and I hope to share some of that experience uh, with you. And it was just, it was just yesterday uh, that I was sitting down with uh, one of our lead technicians going through our Avante, our OptiView Avante instrument. And we came ac uh, across a screen that I had been unfamiliar with regarding the foveal uh, avascular zone in angiography. And so the, the, the technician and I just had a conversation about it. We said, wow, you know, we've been using uh, angio for at least a year, if not longer. And here I came across a new screen that I was unfamiliar with. And in, and, and, and in that moment, I felt both exhilaration, uh, but also kind of overwhelmed. Um, and so I think that that's a lot, a lot of us are experiencing that in, in glaucoma care. Um, exhilaration because we're in the midst of an OCT renaissance, but maybe feeling overwhelmed at times because OCT technology is changing so rapidly. And so part of tonight's, uh, part of tonight is to kind of, you know, reinforce what you already know about glaucoma management when it comes to nerve fiber layer, maybe expand upon some of those ideas with the ganglion cell complex, and maybe get into some new uh, areas in terms of uh, angiography. So that's what we hope to accomplish uh, tonight. So these are my disclosures for tonight's event. So we'll start off kind of uh, with, with a hypothetical question. If you're alone on a deserted island, alone on a deserted island, what instrument will you, would you choose in your glaucoma care? And this actually um, was, was a question posed by one of my glaucoma instructors when I was in optometry school in the mid-90s. And at the time, I think he made a case for an uh, you know, intraocular pressure uh, measure, maybe Goldman or maybe even Shiots in those days, who knows. Uh, but I've heard various other people uh, throw, throw in their ideas. Maybe it would be a retinal camera, it would be, it'd be an ophthalmoscope. Uh, but for me, if I was uh, alone on a deserted island, uh, my choice would be, uh, with thousands of patients who have glaucoma, for me, the choice would be uh, an OCT. And uh, in fact, there's a group of researchers who actually asked this same question um, in, in, a, in, in a slightly different way. Uh, this group of, of researchers uh, looked at visual fields, stereo uh, photographs, and OCT, and they, they tried to find uh, which was the best at differentiating early glaucoma, and they found in this particular study that it was an OCT uh, instrument. So that really tells you how far we've come. For example, when I graduated in the 90s uh, from, from optometry school, this was the established glaucoma paradigm where structure was important, but maybe it was a little more important about intraocular pressure um, and visual fields. Not to say that structure was not important. Certainly, optic nerve head assessment was, was important, but when you're talking about um, uh, progression, uh, structure was, was, you know, comparing optic nerve head photographs, we know there are a lot of limitations. So, interactive pressure and visual field was really 
the main, uh, the main tools to manage glaucoma. Whereas now, we're evolving in, in saying that, yes, intraocular pressure, we know it's still important, uh, but maybe it's not quite as important as we, as we thought it was in those days. And yes, visual field is so important, uh, particularly in, in uh, advanced cases of glaucoma, but structurally, we still find, uh, we are finding more and more that structure is, is, is quite important. And while we don't want to diminish the utilization of optic nerve head photographs, I, I think OCT, because of its reliability, its reproducibility, and its objective way of, of, uh, of, of assessing the, the nerve, nerve fiber layer, and ganglion cell complex, OCT is really becoming a mainstay in, uh, in glaucoma care these days. We're going to touch upon several areas of interest in OCT. We're going to uh, look at look at all five of these areas uh, within uh, kind of within our uh, within our plan for the next few minutes. Let's start off with the circumpapillary scan. I think it's important to remember that a lot of our printouts we get the nerve fiber layer, we get the ganglion cell complex. Uh, which are which are very important, and, and in our minds, maybe there's a bit of magic from the time the patient gets the scan to the time we're seeing the printout. And those are all very, very good and very, uh, very important pieces of information. But are we getting what we think we're getting? And this is maybe kind of a, a, a way for us uh, we can go back and, and really look at the circumpapillary scan to make sure that our scan is accurate. Make sure that those layers are well-defined. Make sure we're not missing some of those areas from patients blinking. So uh, that circumpapillary scan within the OptiView um, platform can be found within, your, uh, within the uh, nerve fiber layer uh, printout. Or with, if you're in this, the, the program itself, the nerve fiber layer portion uh, of that. So that is a, that, that's something that I encourage you to go back and look at from time to time, uh, particularly if you're not sure if you have a good quality of scan. Um, here's an example. Uh, in the top um, right, we see the NSTIN scan. And, and essentially, that's looking at, at a, a, a circumpapillary scan. But you can see where the white arrow is at, at the top part of that black and white picture. That corresponds to the bottom arrow, the bottom black arrow in the part just below where we see the, the green, yellow, red part of our database. So it's nice to see, okay, where we're seeing thinning, where the black arrow is, it's nice to go back and look at the circumpapillary scan to make certain that that kind of lines up. And again, we're seeing what we think we're seeing. Just a word about normative, uh, normative databases. Uh, I, I don't like to read uh, quotes verbatim, but I think this is, this is worthwhile. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Michael Lettys from Moorfield kind of says the, the, uh, the ability of these images to detect subtle and early changes is limited by the quality of the image, that's what we kind of referenced on the last slide, and the robustness of the reference database. And that's a really important point. So for example, on our color uh, nerve fiber layer reflectance scan on the right-hand side, we have um, the reflectance image of the right eye, so super temporally and infratemporally, we're seeing that that nerve fiber layer is nice and thick. But then in each different sector, for example, the ST sector, it assigns um, microns to 120 microns. And then if we go supranasal, 82 microns, and all around the horn here, where it's being compared to a database. And all too often as practitioners, uh, we fall into that trap of saying, oh, look, it's green. Uh, it's fine. Uh, there's no glaucoma here. Or red, it's not fine. Uh, that, that, that they definitely have glaucoma. But we have to remember that this instrument, as good as it is, it's a tool. It's, a, it's a, an accessory to you as a doctor making the diagnosis of glaucoma conversion and glaucoma progression. So when we talk about the norm, normative uh, database, here, here are the, the, the databases that we're making these comparisons. So we have Popcon at the bottom, Spectralis, Cirrus, uh, and Avante. Um, and then if, if there are any uh, OptiView, uh, iView users, that database actually is 499. And so we kind of see that, that um, all of the databases 
contain a certain number of patients, contain a certain number of refractive errors, and contain a certain number of, uh, of different, uh, different races. And so we have to make, you know, we have to, to realize that depending on your patient's uh, race, their uh, ethnicity, their refractive error, their, um, you know, their age, you're going to be put into, they're going to be compared to a group of patients that you, you may have a dozen or two dozen uh, or sometimes even less to compare, compare uh, to, to. So keep in mind that normative databases are, they help you make a statistical analysis. They're not really telling you whether, whether or not there's glaucoma. Okay. Looking at the next slide, the optic nerve head map and nerve fiber layer. So that's really where, you know, that's where a lot of the bread and butter is. That's kind of, you know, for those of, of us who have been using OCTs, which is probably uh, just about all of us on the call tonight, nerve fiber layer is where we realized uh, how important uh, OCT was for us. So, so, but again, remember that we have to always go back and look at the anatomy. So I thought this slide was nice because the, on the right, that's the, 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 um, the printout that we're looking at on a daily basis. But sometimes we have to remember, we have to go back and on the left is kind of a, a representation of the true anatomy. And in the middle is almost like an augmented reality uh, picture where the, uh, the scan is actually superimposed on the anatomy. So that's really what we're looking at. We have to keep that in mind. It's just not a magical, magical printout. It's referencing the anatomy. There are a lot of metrics when it comes to the nerve fiber layer. And so as we look at the middle portion of our, um, our slide here, we can see average nerve fiber layer thickness, average superior nerve fiber layer thickness, inferior nerve, uh, nerve fiber layer thickness. Those are all very important. And then when we go into the optic nerve head analysis itself, that is important as well. Um, so, uh, you know, I hesitate to kind of throw these numbers out, but I do think it's important to keep some of these numbers in the back of our mind. So when we're assessing nerve fiber layer, use caution when the average nerve fiber layer thickness is less than 75 microns. So certainly that would raise a red flag. Or if the inter-eye asymmetry is greater than 9 microns, that should also be a red flag. So here we have an example uh, on our left of some of those summary uh, parameters. We can see the right eye in green and the left eye in red. And so, uh, you know, we can see, that, you know, if we go back to our, um, uh, the top part where we say, hey, if it's less than 75 microns, really, really be concerned about that or at least have it raise a red flag. In this particular case, the left eye in the nerve fiber leg layer thickness is, is definitely raising that red flag. And then on the bottom part, the inner eye asymmetry is greater than nine microns. We can see in this particular example, and this is, you know, an obvious example. Most of uh, the examples we deal with on a daily basis are not quite this obvious, but to bring home the point, we can see a difference in the average nerve fiber layer thickness of actually 26 between the right eye and the left eye, and that certainly raises some red flags. Uh, we, looking, looking at the uh, reflectance image, on the left we have an example of normal. So when we look at these, uh, not only are, are we looking at the thickness uh, of the supertemporal area and infratemporal area, because that's where a lot of the, uh, the action is in glaucoma. That's the, when we see change, a lot of time it happens in those areas. But we're also looking to see, does it extend all the way to the boundary of, uh, of the scan that we're taking? Uh, for example, in the right eye, that's an, or excuse me, on the on your right is an example of a patient uh, that has uh, that does have glaucoma, and so their nerve fiber layer, the reflectance is being flagged supertemporally uh, as far as uh, being yellow and 100 microns, and infratemporally being red and 89 microns. So not only you know as you compare those two different pictures, you're seeing a difference in the reflectance image. You are also uh, seeing a uh, a, a difference in how that reflectance extends to the, the border of the scan that you're taking, where particularly infratemporally, you're seeing quite, uh, quite a bit of, um, 
quite a bit of blue, quite a bit of thinning. So that raises uh, some red flags as well. Next, let's get into the uh, ganglion cell complex. As before, we have the, our, our standard ganglion cell complex printout on the left, and all the way on the right, we have an example of the, um, an example of the anatomy itself. And in the middle, we have an example of the augmented reality uh, picture that I talked about where it's superimposed one on the other. So this really captures the area that we're scanning. The ganglion cell complex, when it comes to the OptiView, and each, uh, each different company measures this site slightly differently, uh, OptiView, uh, the ganglion cell complex is made up, it measures the nerve fiber layer and it measures the ganglion cell layer and the inner plexiform layer. So on the top right, we can kind of see just how the OptiView kind of segments out all of those different layers and it combines the top two to make the ganglion cell complex scan. And on our left, we can, uh, you know, we kind of have an appreciation of the anatomy itself. So why should we even look at macular ganglion cell complex? You know, you may remember, like I do, the days where all the OCTs had uh, had the nerve fiber layer uh, out, came out with it, and we all realized how important that was. But Optiview really led the way when it comes to ganglion cell complex. So there was this debate within the field of glaucoma. Is ganglion cell complex even, or even important? Well, we know that it is because we know that macular damage is common and may occur early in glaucoma. Some studies say, and uh, Dr. Hood from New York is kind of leading the charge in this, saying that you may notice macular damage in 50% of all glaucoma patients. And so, so we now know how important the ganglion cell complex scan and how important it is to look in the macular area. We also know that focal defects are more uh, reliable indicators of damage than sometimes overall thinning. They're both important, but we know that glaucoma can affect in a focal way, an asymmetric focal way. Um, and so we know that, we know because of those two reasons, uh, looking at the macular ganglion cell complex is important. And if it's affecting you know, areas close to the macula, it's gonna impact that patient's quality of life. And so we're, we're really um, hypersensitive now using the ganglion cell complex scan to be able to recognize damage when you see it and intervene uh, appropriately to preserve as much uh, central function as, as possible. Looking uh, at the ganglion cell complex metrics, we are, uh, you know, here's the right eye and the left eye, and, and uh, all of these important, are, are important. Well, we can look at the total thickness, breaks it up into superior thickness, inferior thickness, um, compares the two eyes, and then it looks at two, two different metrics that are very important. One is the FLV, that stands for focal loss volume percentage, and then GLV stands for global uh, loss volume percentage. Uh, and I'll explain a little bit more in detail what those are. So global loss volume, if we kind of go across, we see the picture in the top right, that is when the ganglion cell complex is being lost in a diffuse kind of way. The focal loss volume is, uh, is as the name implies, it's being lost in a focal kind of way. So those are two graphic representations of what GLV and FLV need. And then as we look down at our slide, uh, our, our, the bottom right-hand part of our slide, we can see, again, the FLV percentage and GLV percentage as well. The FLV percentage, I really want to kind of uh, highlight that because there was a study in 2016 in the American Journal of Ophthalmology, and they found that the FLV percentage was the most significant predictive factor for visual field progression. The most significant predictive factor for visual field predict, uh, 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 progression. And that's compared against um, uh, pachymetry that's compared against a lot of these other uh, parameters, and it found that that was, the, that was the one factor that stood heads and tails above the rest. So if you're not looking at the FLV percentage on a regular basis, I would encourage you to do so. Use caution when the inner eye asymmetry of the ganglion cell complex is greater than five microns, or when you see uh, asymmetry uh, across the temporal uh, horizontal refet. 
Here is an example uh, of, of those. So as we look at our metrics in the top left-hand portion of our slide, again, we're comparing kind of the right eye and the left eye right in green as you go down and left eye uh, red, we can see that the total thickness in the right eye is 100.49 and the left eye is 74.49. Uh, that is an inner eye difference of 26. So if you're getting an inner eye asymmetry greater than five microns, that should raise a red flag. In this particular case, we're getting 26. If we look at the, the, uh, the picture in the bottom left-hand corner, we're seeing the ganglion cell complex, and we're seeing that thinning. That represents classic glaucoma thinning that we see within the ganglion cell complex. It goes right across the uh, temporal horizontal with Fe, um, and, and that, is, that is really, really classic. So, to keep watch over, over for those. Again, here's an example, normal on our left, glaucomatous on our right. But we have to be careful when we're using the ganglion cell complex. We can't use it in isolation because any type of patient with macular disease, it is going to throw off the ganglion cell complex. Here's an example of a patient with a, an epiretinal membrane uh, that uh, is, is giving us a great uh, ganglion cell complex at the bottom right-hand side. This, this, you would have to kind of realize that that is affecting the ganglion cell complex. Macular degeneration can affect it. Macular holes can affect it. Diabetic macular edema can affect it. So be very careful that, you're, that that's not uh, throwing off of your results uh, during your interpretation. Okay, now we've gone, we've gone through the nerve fiber layer, we've gone through the ganglion cell complex, and putting it all together, um, I think that's the picture on the right-hand side is good because it really shows you the anatomy that we're scanning, and a lot of times those should match up. Of course, we may see um, some glaucoma happening in the ganglion cell complex first, we may see sometimes it happening within the nerve fiber layer first, but ultimately they should agree, and in many cases, if not most, they do. So let's just take a look at a couple of examples. On our left, we can kind of see um, an example of, of great nerve fiber layer and great ganglion cell complex. Again, just because those we're seeing green doesn't necessarily mean that there is or isn't glaucoma, but when we look at the pattern, we can feel pretty good about the thickness of, of those. On the right-hand side is an example of a nerve fiber layer that is, is visibly reduced. We can see the pattern both in the supratemporal portion uh, of that left eye and the infratemporal portion. Those are both being flagged as, as red. And then when we look at the pattern itself, we can kind of see it, it really does thin out as it's going towards the, uh, the end of the, the scan itself uh, supratemporally. And then as we follow the ganglion cell complex out, we can see uh, that it is thinned exactly in the areas that you would expect based on the nerve fiber layer uh, scan. So this, this is an example of, of really good agreement between the nerve fiber layer and the ganglion cell complex. We can also use the TISNET reference uh, chart. Uh, so on our left-hand side, we're seeing uh, the right eye and the left eye being compared to the database, you know, as we're looking at the green, yellow, and red, and remember green uh, represents, you know, patients within the database within 95%, the yellow uh, is less than 5%, and the, uh, the uh, red is less than 1%. So we can kind of see where this patient falls all across the TISNET, uh, the TISNET uh, scan, the circumpapillary scan, essentially. And then on the right-hand side, we could look at symmetry, you know, just comparing the right and the left, and is the difference between those two significant? Here's an example of using the TISNET to our advantage, where on the right, uh, excuse me, on the left-hand side, we can see that the TISNET area is very symmetric. Uh, those two curves follow each other quite well. While on the right-hand side, we can see that the, uh, the solid line is the right eye, so that would be the one being affected uh, on the bottom right-hand side where we see uh, that particular scan. And the left eye is much higher, so it's being flagged, that red area between the right eye and the left eye, right on the border of the supratemporal and supranasal, 
that is being flagged for being, uh, have, having some asymmetry. And that's an example of a patient with glaucoma. Okay, so uh, here is an example uh, of kind of a, um, a much, more, um, uh, much more subtle case where we have a patient uh, with the right eye, that's the top two uh, circles that we're seeing, and the bottom two is our left eye. Now, most, most of us know that, but if there's anyone that's not, I just want to verify, uh, just kind of reinforce that fact. Um, and then when we look in the, the, the right eye, we can kind of see that the infratemporal area is being flagged. Uh, we can also see the, the reflectance image of the nerve fiber layer start to break off as it gets close to that 101 uh, uh, reading. We also see a little blip in the ganglion cell complex on the left-hand side of our screen, whereas in the left eye, there is one area that's being flagged, uh, the TL portion is being flagged at 52, but the ganglion cell complex looks great. So as we look at that, we, we say, okay, well, maybe that, that right eye looks significant, but may, may, maybe it doesn't. However, when we kind of really focus in on the Tisnet uh, chart, we see, yes, there's a difference between the right eye and the left eye super temporally, but there's an even bigger difference when we look infranasal and infratemporal. Again, so I'm looking uh, IN on the bottom hand, uh, the bottom part of your, your slide that you're looking at, and IT, there's a big difference there. That's being flagged in yellow, but that is an example of a patient that's having, that has uh, some glaucomatous loss in the right eye that subtly you can pick up on the Tisnet uh, chart. So let's go through a couple of examples. Here's an example uh, of, of a patient. We would look at this and we'd say, okay, all right, the, the reflectance image of the nerve fiber layer, which is the circle that we're seeing top center, and the ganglion cell complex uh, top left, we look at those two patterns and we'd say, that looks great. And then in the bottom part, we're looking at uh, the, the nerve fiber layer bottom left, and the ganglion cell complex bottom middle, and we say those look good. Uh, as we look at the tisnet on the bottom right, that looks great as well. And this would be an example of a completely normal patient. This is example two, where we see on our middle circle, top middle circle, we see the reflectance image is significantly reduced, both supertemporal and infratemporal. We see that in the reflectance pattern, but it's also being flagged uh, according to the sector database um, in many, almost all of the areas. Whereas the ganglion cell complex is completely kind of the, all that green is washed out and replaced with red. So that right eye is significantly affected. And on the bottom part of the scan, the nerve fiber layer on the bottom left is reduced. It's super, it's, 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 uh, it's really thinned. And on the ganglion cell complex middle center, that is reduced as well. So this would be an example of a patient with glaucoma in both eyes with a significantly reduced OCT. Now we look at this example three and we say, okay, in the middle center section, we can see the, uh, the nerve fiber layer reflectance looks pretty good, looks pretty good. There's not being flagged uh, at all, is it? It looks, um, it looks, it looks pretty, pretty decent. However, in the ganglion cell complex, left center, we see that, uh, that, that asymmetry of, uh, you know, across the refe. Um, that is an example of a patient with glaucoma that's not really being seen as much in the nerve fiber layer. However, we, if we look really closely, we can see infratemporally in that right eye, there's one little area of thinning that doesn't really stand out according to the database, but it's there. Whereas the left eye is showing no difference. If we look at the bottom right-hand part of the Tisnet symmetry part, plot, we are also seeing some significant differences between the right eye and the left eye. So that's an example of glaucoma in the right eye. Left eye looks good. Let's touch a bit on uh, progression now. Um, well, there's two, two main uh, tools that we can use uh, at our disposal when we talk about progression. One is event-based, you know, simply comparing one test to the next, and the other is trend-based, which is really being uh, concerned with the rate of change. So let's see how we can use both of those to our advantage. Here's an example um, of a patient that had a devastating glaucoma, catastrophic uh, glaucoma from one, uh, from, from one scan to the other. I won't go into you know, any, too many details about how that happened, but it was essentially a case of exfoliation that the patient missed uh, several years of follow-up. 
comes back in and this is what we see. So in the ganglion cell complex, looking at the left, that's all green, that looks wonderful, but then the first scan, which was four years later, just to the right of that is red. Comparing those two, the first to the second, in looking at how different that pattern is, we're using event-based pattern analysis to look at the difference between those two. Then if we look at the nerve fiber layer um, in the bottom center circle, compare that to the second circle, how, how we lose a lot of that reflectance in nerve fiber layer, again, comparing that one to the next is using event-based. Also in the bottom right-hand side, we can use our Tisnet chart, but that's, you know, looking at uh, those different scans, the black line on the bottom right-hand side, where it's the highest, that's the baseline, and the brown line, which is the lowest, that is the most recent. So looking at those differences, uh, that's using event-based event analysis to make your, make your uh, confirm your diagnosis. So uh, when we talk about event-based, there are some pros and there are some cons. It's easy to use. Uh, it's pattern-based. You can use your reflectance images and your TISNET chart, just like I showed you, so that we can look at progression. But there are some uh, drawbacks to event base. You can miss slow progression. If the progression is really slow, it could lull you into sleep um, and, and you won't necessarily uh, see those differences. It's also susceptible to outliers. And so if you get maybe a scan that um, the thickness really decreases one to the next, but you realize, wow, that second scan wasn't nearly as accurate, it's falsely telling you something that, that is not true. Conversely, um, a reduced quality of scan may give you thicker, uh, you know, thicker nerve fiber layer ganglion cell complex than what is real. So you really have to, you know, be, be aware of those things, particularly if you're using event-based analysis. Trend-based analysis, here's an example. On the left-hand side, we have nerve fiber layer trend-based analysis. On the right-hand side, we have ganglion cell complex uh, analysis. And so, so as we kind of take a look here at, uh, at kind of our, our whole slide uh, together, uh, we can kind of see um, the trend base. The bottom left-hand side is the nerve fiber layer trend analysis. The bottom right-hand side is the ganglion cell complex trend analysis. Um, a couple of, 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 uh, of other thoughts about that is that um, you kind of see on the trend based analysis there is a gray area that's bracketing uh, the actual line. That's our confidence interval. We want that as, as thin and as tight as possible. And so sometimes if you get a bad, uh, an inaccurate scan, it'll make that gray area much wider, and you have to keep that in mind as you're trying to make assessments. Uh, we'll talk about that just a little more in a few, in a few moments. Okay. Now, uh, the pros and cons of trend-based, it's less susceptible to fluctuation because it's looking at change over a period of time, which is very, very important. And also, the, uh, the cons of it is it requires a large number of tests. So if you get three scans, it's hard to make a, a good assessment based on that, but five, six, seven scans, you're going, you should have uh, more confidence, particularly if your confidence interval looks, looks better. So a ganglion cell complex progression using the two together, using the event-based and trend-based together, if we look at our pictures on the top, the ganglion cell complex circle scan, we can kind of see this is an example of a patient with progressive glaucoma. We can see that our progression, we can see that our pattern is changing, and that red island that on the second scan had just a little bit of red, a little bit of yellow, and then in the third scan it gets bigger and subsequently gets bigger and bigger, that's using a kind of event-based. And the trend-based, looking at the bottom part of that slide, is, is showing you also that it's changing. We have a good confidence, confidence interval on the bottom part of that scan. We also have um, the little... Uh, uh, um, if you go to the top of that graph, there's a purple area that um, if, if the OptiView uh, analysis thinks that it's changing uh, in a significant way, it'll outline that area in purple. If it's kind of, if it's not certain, it'll be pink. And if it doesn't think it's changing, then it won't give you a color at all. So keep that in mind. 
And then the nerve fiber layer analysis, looking at that change as time goes by, looking at the top part, we're looking at the pattern based as time goes by, that event, uh, looking at that event analysis, seeing what happens every time they come in, come in and you can see that that trend, excuse me, you can see that that pattern is changing. And then the bottom part of the nerve fiber uh, layer uh, analysis, we can, we can see we have a nice confidence interval, but it is being flagged. Not only are we seeing that trend line decrease, but we're also seeing a little bit of purple uh, there as, as well uh, in, as far as the rate of change. Um, and if we look at our TISNIT uh, event analysis, we can see that the first scan was in black, that's the highest, our most recent scan was in orange, that's the lowest. And we can kind of really see that, that uh, we're losing nerve fiber layer as time goes by. Okay. What about normal aging changes? How, how, in just normal aging changes, how much change can we expect to see? And are we seeing sometimes um, in these patients that we think are, are pro progressing, is that sometimes due to aging changes? Well, it was a, a good study that showed that the ganglion cell complex on average decreases about a quarter uh, micron per year. Um, whereas the uh, nerve fiber layer uh, decreases about 0.14 microns per year. So anything above that oftentimes will get flagged as being statistically significant. Another way to think about it is we lose 0.2% per year of age-related thinning in our fiber layer and ganglion cell complex. Be careful about high myopia. Here's a case of an 84-year-old white male who has a Tmax of 27 and 24. So those pressures are, are, are in an area of potential concern. Average pressures in the mid-teens. Pre-cataract surgery, Rx was minus 10. Uh, in the right eye and the left eye, pachymetry, 601.599. You can see the coronal hysteresis of 13.7 and 13.9. So there, there are some red flags being raised here. Here's an example, or here are pictures of, of the fundus. And we look at these nonspecific changes within the uh, octopus visual field. And here's the OCT. And if we look at this OCT, uh, we would look at the pattern based of the, the pattern of the ganglion cell complex, and we can see along the top, it really doesn't change much. Um, and in the, the nerve fiber layer, in that middle section of circles going across, um, it's hard to tell what's going on. But if we go down to our trend base, looking at the bottom left-hand side, we'd say, wow, that nerve fiber layer looks like it's really changing quite a bit. Wow, this patient has glaucoma and, and we need to be careful about that. But look at the ganglion cell complex trend, bottom right-hand side. Look at how flat that is. Um, and then if we look in the middle right-hand section of the TISNET, we can see that because of this patient's myopia and quite a bit of parapapillary atrophy, we are getting all kinds of crazy scans. So in this particular case, when we see these tie-dye patterns in the middle of the nerve fiber layer and high myopia, we really have to look for the ganglion cell, look towards the ganglion cell complex to help us out. Here's another example of another high myopic, myopic patient, 58-year-old Asian male with Tmax of 21 and 20 uh, with a refractive error of minus 7. You can kind of see the pictures here. Um, and, and the visual field is showing maybe some central changes, maybe some arcuate changes. Um, but when we look at the OCT across the top, the ganglion cell complex, we can see that that ganglion cell complex pattern is absolutely changing. And then when we look at the nerve fiber layer across the middle, that is changing as well. That's being confirmed now in our nerve fiber layer scan uh, trend analysis, bottom left-hand side. It's also being flagged in purple as reduced, being uh, losing one micron per year. Um, and then in the ganglion cell complex, that's being flagged as being losing 0.78 microns per year. And our confidence intervals are great, super, super thin in those particular uh, areas. So we can, so, so, um, you know, what I'm, the point that I'm trying to make here is in the ganglion cell complex and high myopia really look towards the ganglion cell complex. It has a higher di diagnostic power than nerve fiber layer to discriminate glaucoma patients from non-glaucoma patients in high myopia. So let the ganglion cell complex um, put, put a little more weight in that when it comes to the high myopes. Let's talk a little bit about angio. Uh, angio has now come on the scene. Here's an example on the top right of a normal angio scan, where on the bottom right, we can kind of see an example of moderate glaucoma. And there's, there's a lot of studies now looking at angio 
kind of saying, okay, we, we understand that the angio changes as glaucoma progresses, but some of these, uh, some of these uh, references that are here, for example, the first reference, they did an amazing job because they looked at three different groups of individuals. One group uh, had glaucoma and they looked at, well, they broke them up. One eye had visual field defect. The other eye had no visual field defect. And then, so that was, so one group was the eye with the visual field defect. Second group was the eye without the visual field defect. Third, the third grouping was age match normals. And they found that OCTA, of course it was reduced in the eye with the visual field defect. We would expect that. And of course it was normal in the, in the age match controls. But what they didn't expect is in the eye with, without the visual field defect, it was also reduced. So the, 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 the authors kind of concluded that early, uh, we're, we're picking up early changes within angio uh, within, with, uh, when, it, when it comes to glaucoma. And here's another picture, normal bottom left-hand side, moderate glaucoma, middle and advanced glaucoma. So we've been uh, you know, long wondering what angio is looking like, uh, it's going to, whether it's going to give us additional information as it relates to the management of glaucoma. And now the studies are starting to prove that it, that it is. It's giving us something different, something new. But the same way that the ganglion cell complex is affected in glaucoma, when it comes to macular angio, it is as well. So and the left-hand side is normal, middle, moderate glaucoma, right-hand side is advanced glaucoma. And if you haven't looked at a lot of these angio slides, the dark areas, the dark blue patches, that, uh, that means there's not as much perfusion in those particular areas. So here's one, one case of angio that I want to discuss. A 66-year-old white male referred to the Glaucoma Institute of State College in January because of asymmetric IOP reported at 15 millimeters of mercury in the right eye and 25 in the left eye. History of trauma in the left eye 25 years ago. Pressures that particular day with our ORA was 60.5 and 27.2. You can kind of see uh, the hysteresis and the chemistries and the CVs. And so uh, at that visit, uh, we, did, we did a visual field, and that visual field is about as clean as, uh, as, as, as you're going to see, completely normal, not picking up anything whatsoever. Here was the, uh, the OCT that particular day uh, in January, and we kind of see uh, the right ganglion cell complex looks great. It, the infratemporal is being flagged in, uh, in, in, in the yellow. A um, little thin in that area, but that's the eye with the great pressure, remember? And the eye with the high pressure, the nerve fiber layer looks great supertemporally and infratemporally, and the ganglion cell complex looks good, except for that one little red spot there. And so, uh, so we, you know, we, oh, in the ERG, in the ERG, the right eye was, was a little bit reduced, but looks good. But the left eye, the eye with the higher pressure, looked amazing, looked, 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 looked great. So at that point, we offered the patient the option of drops, laser, or monitoring. And so we said, okay, let's, we all agreed, let's monitor. So the four-month visit, everything was the same. The eight-month visit, which was, which was just uh, about a month ago, uh, just a little over a month ago, pressure's now 16.2 in the right eye, 29.3 in the left, visual field stable and unremarkable, HRT stable, ERG stable and unremarkable. Um, and so we look at the, 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 the standard scan, and across the top, the ganglion cell complex, uh, you know, we're seeing a little bit of, um, uh, you know, uh, may, maybe uh, uh, a, a couple little artifacts there. The nerve fiber layer looks great. The tisnet on the middle right looks great. And the, gang, the nerve fiber layer bottom left uh, looks good, but our confidence interval is not good. The ganglion cell complex rate of change, slight slope, but that uh, that is, uh, we, don't, we don't have high confidence uh, with that as well. But now we've got some angio scan. So in the right eye, remember, that's the eye with the lower uh, intraocular pressure. If we look at our baseline top left versus our follow-up in the right eye top right, there's no real uh, changes in either the pattern or the numbers. But in the left eye, we look at uh, the baseline uh, compared to the one on the right, which is the follow-up. And we can see if we went right around the clock, you know, top, we go from 36 to 34. Uh, top left, we go from 47 to 40. And if we went right around, we would see a reduction in the, the, the perfusion uh, across the board, as well as the pattern. 
look, there's more uh, non-perfusion on the right-hand side than there is in, uh, on, on the left-hand side. Then if we look at the bottom left-hand side, which is the superior, the right eye is the blue, the left eye is the, uh, the red, we can see the blue is staying about the same superiorly, but the red is losing perfusion. Uh, and and, and the inferiorly, it's kind of the same thing. And then when we go to the whole image, which is the third graph over, we can also see the right eye is holding pretty steady, but the left eye is decreasing. So we might be, we might be seeing something here. We might be seeing the fact that, uh, that we're, we might be losing perfusion. Now, I need to get one more scan before, you know, one or two more scans before we can really say that that's true. But at least the early analysis is we might be seeing change here before we see any, uh, any change in the ERG change with the, the standard OCT. So, so I thought that was an exciting case, um, and that seems to be what the research is, uh, kind of bears out. So a couple last points, and then we'll open it up for questions. We started a wellness, uh, a wellness uh, program within our office, um, um, uh, and this was published in Review of Optometric Business in September. And so, um, you know, like many of you, we had our main OCT unit, and we were using that all day, but it was mainly a referral, uh, you know, you kind of used as a referral uh, area. Um, so we, we uh, uh, eventually purchased four iView units. Uh, we instituted optional wellness scans for all exams, uh, and so uh, what, 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 we, you know, what we started doing is offering patients this, and I was amazed at how much pathology we saw that we would not have seen otherwise. We saw a, a lot of epiretinal membranes. We saw uh, some cases of glaucoma, but here's some numbers that we generated. Um, we, you know, first month that we did it, we generated an additional uh, 11,575. And if we calculate our monthly payments, um, uh, you know, kind of subtract that out, our profit per optometrist per month doing wellness was uh, $1,358. So, uh, so, and then in January, in July, we hit 14,000 in revenue. We've never been under. 11.5 from that first day, and here we are nine months, uh, excuse me, now uh, 11 months into it. So we see more epiretinal membranes, we see more glaucoma, we see more macular degeneration, we see more macular edema, things, uh, subtle cases, subtle cases that are difficult to tell clinically. So it's good for patients, good for the practice. I do want to say one word about uh, OCT and account when it comes to angles, the angles, uh, you know, using that high resolution instrument to look at angles as an adjunct to your gonioscopy is amazing. Here's an example of a patient who, uh, who's, who uh, in, in uh, scotopic conditions in the top scan, her, her angle really would get narrow. And in the bottom scan, uh, under photopic conditions, it would open her angle up. That's really tough to tell in gonioscopy because your light source is really high. And so, uh, so as we take a look, you know, at, at, at those, OCT, because you can do it under uh, scotopic conditions, uh, does an exceptional job. Uh, here's another example of a patient that we ended up doing cataract surgery uh, and goniosynechiolysis to try to open up that angle and open it up, we did. Uh, so that was a, a really successful, uh, successful uh, case there. So uh, at this point, I uh, really want to thank you for uh, your attention and uh, during, during this part, and I now want to open it up to questions. So I see we have a couple of questions here. Uh, so let's take a look at what they are. Here we go. All right, in the software program, where do you find the TISNET summary plot? Uh, so in the software program, the, uh, the TISNET summary plot, if I can kind of uh, go back and address that by looking at the, uh, you know, the actual, the actual slide here. Uh, so here's an example of, uh, are you, see if we're seeing that now. I think that you are, but let me just make sure of that. Okay, so in that particular, uh, in that particular scan, good, here we go. In that particular scan, uh, the TISNET 
chart is um, is on the middle right hand section. That's where you're seeing that summary chart. So that's after you get your first scan. So uh, so on your uh, on on the subsequent scans, that's exactly where you would find it. All right, let's go to next the second question. Uh, let's see if I can bring that up here. Good. All right. Question number two is on the Tisnet chart, the supertemporal asymmetry appears to be explained by just a small lateral shift, uh, which may or may not be real. How often do you see that? That's a, that's a great point. I'm really glad that uh, that you raised that. So let's kind of go back to that particular uh, example. Uh, let's see if I can find it quickly. And uh, and so the question was, I think it's right here, and let's see if we have it up. Oh, yeah, so here's the, the chart, the scan that we were talking about. You can kind of see what the, what the questioner was asking is that um, the one of the, the super temporal hump is, is pushed more, uh, more to the left, and how often do we see that? That's something we see more common in high myopes. High myopes have their kind of their super temporal and infra temporal hump push, you know, kind of more uh, laterally, uh, so to speak. So, so be careful about that when it comes to uh, the high myopes. All right, next question is, um, I guess the Tisnet summary plot only shows up on the Optic Nerve Head GCC uh, OU report. So how do we get to that OU report? Uh, so, how do we get to that report? So here is an example. Again, here here would be uh, maybe an example of your first, you know, of your first slide that of your, this first scan that you take. Uh, but any subsequent scan that you take, you're going to uh, you're going to kind of see it uh, within. Uh, let's see if we, yeah, it's, you're going to find it, you know, when it comes to this particular slide. So you should be able to see the, the OCT Tisnet middle right hand section of that particular slide. Okay, next question. Uh, let's see. Uh, do you only have one case for angiogram showing less perfusion? Yes, so far there are many, many cases, but for the particular, for the, for this particular talk tonight, uh, we just have one example. However, I'm gathering many more examples, um, and so I hope in the near future to be able to show, you know, uh, dozens of examples like uh, like I just showed. Uh, but I'm starting to come up now, you know, third and fourth scan because of how long I've used the angio. So I'm just starting to hit that sweet spot um, in in looking looking at the scans as time goes by. All right, next question. I see a lot of my wellness OCTs show a red arc along the uh, fovea gray circle, along the fovea gray circle. Do you see this often and what does that mean? A red arc along the fovea gray circle. Yeah, so I think what you're talking about is, um, is not so much, uh, let's see if I can um, uh, give an example here. Um, so, so I don't, I actually don't have an eye wellness, uh, slide on here, but I think what you're, what you're asking, uh, you know, what you're asking here is that, um, um, that red arc, if you're talking about within the ganglion cell complex, that would be a red flag. If you're talking about that gray arc on the, uh, the other section that's kind of measuring macular thickness, uh, that 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 to me is important, but it means kind of something different. So, but I think what you're meaning is a red arc. Uh, yeah, if you're seeing the red arc within the ganglion cell complex, you know that that would be an important thing to red flag, and I would have them back for uh, subsequent uh, glaucoma testing. All right, next question. Uh, when you start looking at change analysis, should you adjust your selection of scans to right after starting drops to see if there's less chance? Yeah, so I think that's an excellent point. So the question is, when you start looking at progression and you uh, adjust your therapy, so maybe you start therapy or maybe you do an SLP procedure or a MIGS procedure, I think it's a good idea to mentally understand exactly where, when that takes place, 
and then look at subsequent scans after that. You could kind of, you, you can actually choose within the software which scans you want. So you can kind of exclude um, within the software the scans that you took before that treatment and compare it to scans after you take that treatment. I don't typically do that. I just have a list of dates always in, in my EHR, so as I'm looking at the progression analysis, I can tell, in, I can tell at a glance where uh, we did a change in therapy, and then I can kind of see, okay, are we achieving the, the stability results that I want? Uh, that, that, that's an excellent question. All right, so now uh, the next question, we'll try to hit one or two of these, uh, more of these, and then we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up. Can you diagnose cyclotorsion with the scan, and does that invalidate all OCT metrics? That's, that's, a, that's a, an excellent question. And so I, I've never used the OCT to diagnose cyclotorsion, but many of the times the cyclotorsion is consistent. So maybe with patients who you suspect cyclotorsion, don't pay as much uh, attention to the initial scan, but the subsequent progression analysis should be, uh, should be right on assuming that the cyclotorsion is similar, and it should be. All right, uh, I have never seen a trend analysis. Next question, I've never seen a trend analysis available on my patients. Maybe I haven't had the OCT long enough, but once I do, how do I find the trend analysis report? Uh, okay, so, so it takes three scans to have a trend analysis, uh, to actually do a trend analysis. So maybe it's just that you, you only have two, but if you have three, there is a report that, uh, that says, um, you know, a, a GCC, a GCC and nerve fiber layer um, progression report. And so that is one that we always print out and put in our, um, put in our EHR. But oftentimes I'm also inter interfacing with, the, um, with the, it, it, the OCT information within the software program itself. So I do it both ways. So th those reports are available, and I, I can't tell you exactly how to bring those up right now, but I'm sure your, your rep would be able to help you with that. All right, last question, and then we will finish up. Uh, in the nerve fiber layer analysis of raw data, how much change would be significant for a, for a particular quadrant? Yeah, in the raw analysis, I, I don't necessarily look at that circumpapillary scan and look at the raw analysis I, um, and, and kind of say, okay, how much is significant? How much is thinning? I don't necessarily use it that way, but if I see an area that is being flagged as being thin, then I'll go back and look at the circumpapillary scan, and then I'll kind of make sure that that lines up perfectly to make sure that it's not something else that's causing it, like a bad scan or a blink uh, in that particular area that's throwing things off. So that's how I would answer that question. So uh, at this point, we, we've gone through all the questions. I appreciate your, your time on this. You know, I've made kind of my life's work uh, to, to make it easy for all of us to interpret this. We know there's so much data uh, happening uh, it, within these. But, I, you know, in, in closing, I will, uh, I will say that OCT continues to play an important expanding role in glaucoma management. Glaucoma is an asymmetric disease. Scrutinize the nerve fiber layer and ganglion cell complex when assessing glaucoma conversion. Use a combination of event-based and trend-based analysis to your advantage. And uh, OCT is useful, a uh, useful adjunct to donioscopy when assessing angles. And angio may become a, 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 a very neat method of picking up glaucoma damage earlier. So with that, I will, uh, I will conclude my part of the program. I thank you all for your attention, and I hope this was beneficial.